Good evening and welcome. I'm Paul Kurtz, uh, Interim Laboratory Director here at Argonne. It's uh, my privilege to welcome you here this evening and uh, say thank you as well for your participation uh, coming out this evening. Argonne's always pleased to see uh, such high interest from the community in our work uh, and the things that we're doing here at the laboratory. We're certainly grateful for your support and I know the speakers tonight are as well. Tonight's topic is close to home as many of our, as many of our lives or the lives of our loved ones have been improved or extended uh, thanks to modern pharmaceuticals. Uh, once upon a time, our drugs were discovered largely by luck. Uh, someone found that uh, tea from the willow tree bark eased their headache, and we had aspirin. But we can't uh, rely on luck for relief uh, for complex diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. Finding treatments for these extremely challenging diseases Will have frustrate, which have frustrated doctors for millennia, requires the greatest scientific minds and giving them the latest and most powerful tools to discover what they need. One of those essential tools sits behind us here at the, uh, the Advanced Photon Source, and that's why tonight I'm particularly excited to see this crowd gathered to hear about what we're doing in the building attached to this auditorium, which is one of our greatest sources of pride here at Argonne. It's one of our flagship facilities, the Advanced Photon Source. If you had a bird's eye view, you would see how big the APS actually is. Uh, Wrigley Field could actually sit inside it. Uh, but paradoxically, its great size, size is how we create beams that are powerful enough to see the individual structures that make up the tiniest proteins in our bodies. Um, I'll leave that story of how they do it to, uh, to Lisa and, and Vincent uh, this evening. Uh, Lisa Keefe is Vice President for Advanced Therapeutics at Hopman Woodward Medical Research Institute as well as the faculty director at MCACAT, uh, beamline here at the Advanced Photon Source. MCACAT is a research facility at the APS with specialized equipment for dr drug discovery run by an association of pharmaceutical companies whose name uh, you'd likely recognize, AbbVie, uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Merrick, Novaris, and Pfeiffer. The, both company and academic scientists come from all over the world uh, to use MCACAT which Lisa has led since 2002. Lisa's PhD is from John Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine, where her doctoral thesis was on the crystalline structures of staph and uh, salmonella proteins. She's also the vice president-elect of the American Crystallog Crystallographer? Crystallog <laughs> Crystallographic, I've got it, Crystallographic Association. And Vincent Stoll is one of the scientists who uses MCCAT. Uh, he is the associate director and a research fellow for structural biology at AbbVie, Inc., one of the world's major pharmaceutical research and development uh, companies. Before AbbVie spun off, he had worked at Abbott Laboratories, uh, specializing in drug design and a wide variety of antiviral oncology, neuroscience, and immunological programs. He has a PhD in biochemistry from Albert Einstein College of Medicine and conducted his uh, postdoctoral studies at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. His career in su structural biology includes seven patents and 55 publications. So please welcome uh, Lisa and Vincent. interesting history. It, has, it originated as an herbal folk medicine dating back over 5,000 years ago. Ancient civilizations used the bark to make an extract from the willow tree. And they used this to um, relieve pain from, in their joints or pain from inflammation from a wound. Then around 400 BC in Greece, Hippocrates brewed tea from the willow bark, and he gave it to women to relieve the pain during pregnancy and childbirth. It wasn't until 1828 that the active ingredient in uh, the willow bark was isolated and identified, and that's salicin. But about 25 years later, it was discovered that 
if salicin is converted to salicylic acid, then it's more potent. And you can, it's more amenable to a large-scale production as a medicine. But it was hard to swallow. It irritated the lining of the mouth, the throat, and the stomach. So about 50 years after that, German chemist Felix Hoffmann was working at the pharmaceutical company Bayer, and he discovered that if you add an acetyl group to the salicylic acid to make acetosalicylic acid, that this compound had reduced irritant properties. And so in 1899, Bayer launched aspirin. Now when you consider the size of an aspirin tablet, the size of us, it's quite an effective and versatile drug. It relieves your pain, cools your fever, <coughs> reduces inflammation, and is continued to flourish and expanded in its uses. It's used for preventing, um, prophylactically for preventing heart attacks, stroke, cancer, blood clots, and diabetes, in pregnancy, and in, even in some forms of dementia. So, have you ever wondered, how do drugs work? Well, drugs are like keys. They come in all different sizes and shapes. And just as a key fits into one lock, a drug binds to a specific target. Now, the target would be a key component in the development or progression of an illness or disease. And just as the key opens the lock and changes its shape, a drug would bind to its target, and it would change its target in such a way that it would stop the progression of the disease or the illness. So drugs are highly effective and specific because they interact with a single target. Now to design a drug, we need to know what the target looks like. So the target might have a site to which the drug would bind, and we'd like to know what it looks like and maybe even what the tunnel is that goes into it sort of like a keyhole in the lock. Now consider several potential keys or drug candidates. Now given the shape of this keyhole, right away we can see we can eliminate some of these keys. They simply have the wrong shape, they're not going to fit into that keyhole. So they would not be a good candidate or a good drug uh, candidate. So this narrows down the number of possibilities that we have to investigate. Now although these remaining keys look like they might fit, they may not work very effectively. They may not open that lock. They may not be a good drug for stopping the progression of a disease. To design an effective drug, we need to know what the target looks like in detail, inside, inside the keyhole, inside the target. When the details of the lock or the target are known, then it's possible to strategically design a key or a drug that is highly specific and highly effective. So modern drug discovery starts with understanding the key components in a disease or an illness, and then developing chemical compounds that would inhibit or stop the progression of that illness. So let's return to the story of aspirin. Recall in 1899 that Bayer launched aspirin. But how aspirin worked was a mystery until only recently. It was in the 1970s that Professor John Vane discovered that aspirin works by blocking an enzyme that is responsible for producing hormones that, uh, uh, that are involved in the pain and tissue injury. So for his discovery, he was awarded the 1982 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. <coughs> now the hormones, these hormones are called prostaglandins and they're depicted here. There are many different types of prostaglandins, and they play a very important and central role in maintaining the cell's homeostasis, doing the housekeeping for the cell, regulating the cells, and keeping their steady state when there's perturbations in the environment around them. So unlike other hormones that are produced by glands, the prostaglandin hormones are produced in the cells by an enzyme. This enzyme is cyclooxygenase. Now there are two different types of cyclooxygenase. There's cyclooxygenase 1, 
and that's responsible for producing the prostaglandins that are primarily maintaining your cells. For instance, they are responsible for maintaining the mucus lining of your stomach, so it protects your stomach from the acid juices. Now the other cyclooxygenase, and we call these COX-1 and COX-2, COX-2 is responsible for producing the prostaglandins that are involved in pain and inflammation. So suppose you get injured, bruise your knee. Well, when that happens, the cyclooxygenase enzymes become very active and produce lots and lots of prostaglandins. And that's, these prostaglandins, especially the ones coming from COX-2, strengthen the pain signal and induce inflammation. So that's now starting the repair process from your injury. Now aspirin acts by blocking the action of both of those cyclooxygenase enzymes. As a result, the amount of prostaglandins decreases and your pain and inflammation go down. But it also reduces the prostaglandins that are maintaining the lining of your stomach. So that's why aspirin has this side effect. It causes bleeding or ulcers. And this is a very undesirable side effect. So the ideal drug would be one that does not, uh, does not activate or block all, both cyclooxygen um, enzymes, but rather is more selective. <coughs> So let's look at the aspirin molecule. Aspirin's a drug, it's a small molecule chemical, acetyl salicylic acid, and here's its chemical structure. What's important to note, though, is that it has three-dimensional structure. So the dark are the carbon atoms, the red is the oxygen, and the light are the hydrogen atoms. Now remember the shape. Look at the shape of the aspirin molecule, okay? Next slide, you're going to see its target. So there's its target. It's, it's actually a cyclooxygenase. It's COX-2. Cox, this is only half of COX-2, to be honest with you. The other, it, Cox, the full enzyme is comprised of two of these subunits. But the aspirin enters right down here. This is the keyhole, the keyhole in the lock. This is the entry where aspirin would bind. Now, if we wanted to design a more selective drug, we'd have to know more than just where it enters into the protein. We'd have to know what it's like inside the protein. So again, take note of this protein molecule and its orientation. I'm going to show you the same protein, just a different way of viewing it. Now you can see the inside. So it has a couple of different subunits, and that's the blue and the yellow and the green. The red is a cofactor it's needed for action. But the interesting part is actually the pink. The pink is like, it, it shows the volume of the tunnel or the access for the aspirin molecule. So consider the lock. What if I took bubble gum and I stuffed it into the keyhole of the lock, and then I stripped away the front face of the lock, what you would see is you see that bubble gum stuffed into the cavity. So this pink is just a representation of that empty volume. Now the aspirin molecule enters here. You notice it's fairly wide at the entry. And then as the aspirin molecule travels deeper into the enzyme, the tunnel narrows. And it narrows to a point where it's just the right fit for that aspirin molecule. So when we're designing drugs, we want to have an absolute perfect fit inside that, in, inside that tunnel. I think this is you. So I'm going to be doing uh, my Vanna White imitation today. So I'll come in and take over and change the slide once in a while. Uh, but my role here is to inform you all about the pharmaceutical drug discovery business and what's involved, how do we discover and develop drugs. 
The very first and most important thing to understand about what we do and why we do it, why am I motivated to go to work every day, and it is absolutely about the patient. There is a critical need for innovative drugs, and that started all the way back with willow bark and extends on to the complex diseases of today. So if you think about what we've done, certainly my company, Abby, and, and the industry in general, back when I joined over 20 years ago, we were in the midst of the AIDS HIV battle, where millions and millions of people were dying worldwide. The pharmaceutical industry came together, we worked very hard, and what we've been able to do is convert this disease into a chronic, manageable disease, and people are living long, fulfilling lives and not going through the horrible process uh, that is involved in dying from HIV and AIDS. Similarly, hepatitis C is a slow killer. It takes decades for you to die from hepatitis C, but make no mistake, mistake you will die You'll get liver cancer, you'll get cirrhosis, you'll need liver transplants if you're lucky, but it is a deadly disease. Once again, the industry came together, AbbVie, one of my very first projects was actually hepatitis C 20 years ago, and we came up with a cure. And in fact, we're about to launch a, a cure that is pangenotypic. In other words, there are many different types of hepatitis C and drugs are effective against different combinations, we have a drug that's going to be effective against all of them worldwide, including the primary uh, hepatitis C genotypes in the third world. Now, what we're doing is we're curing the disease. So we're going to eliminate our market. And that's very important to understand. Because recently, I was working with the North Chicago High School on a challenge they had about what could they be doing uh, to help cancer patients through their journey. And one of the high school students pretty much floored me when she said, I don't even know why we're doing this challenge. And I'm like, you don't think this is important? She says, well, but we all know you guys have the cure for cancer. You don't want to let it out. Well, that's complete nonsense because I refer back to hepatitis C. We do this because it is the right thing to do. There is no doubt we are going to make money uh, while we're going through and curing those patients, but it's important to do. And I can guarantee you, because we're all the same as all the rest of everybody else, our friends, our families, ourselves. Uh, I've lost two colleagues out of my area from cancer. So if I thought for one instance that we had a cure for cancer and we're sitting on it, there'd be a, a tremendous uproar. It's simply not true. It's a very complex set of diseases and very difficult to treat, but the progress we're making is remarkable, and I'll show you some of that. Immunological diseases affects one-third of Americans, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, anywhere where our immune system goes awry. Alzheimer's disease is an incredibly devastating disease, and devastating for the patient, but in many ways even worse for the families, and the impact on the healthcare system, where you're spending hundreds of billions of dollars, in caring for these patients, because they live for quite a while and need a lot of care. That's a tremendous burden on the system, terrible for the patient, and the number of patients is skyrocketing. We're getting more and more Alzheimer's patients. So imagine coming up with a, a cure or a treatment for that. Now, what many people don't realize is our efforts in neglected diseases. AbbVie, like quite a number of our pharma partners, uh, have developed partnerships with uh, various foundations, such as the Gates Foundation. There are millions and millions of people that are suffering from parasitic diseases worldwide, all in the poor developing countries, uh, and those have been neglected for years. Well, we're not neglecting them anymore. We're partnering up, and we're actually working on coming up with treatments uh, for more and more of these neglected diseases. The bottom line is, the patient is critical, and time is critical for the patient. So here's the basic premise again. Lisa's already shown you this in, in uh, kind of a nicer form, but very simplistically, you have a target. It typically binds some sort of ligand, 
And when things go awry, that leads to disease. And fundamentally, what we're trying to do is come up with a drug, which can be a small molecule or an antibody, a biologic, that leads to a therapy. So, what is a drug target? I'm passing <laughs> it back. So recall that aspirin's target is the enzyme cyclooxygenase. It's a protein, and proteins are tiny molecular machines that perform most of the tasks needed to keep the cells alive. Now, drugs can be used to turn these proteins on or off, activate them or deactivate them. So what does a protein look like? Well, the building blocks of proteins are all of these 20 amino acids. We have some that are nonpolar, some that are polar, some that are electrically charged. Consider salad dressing, oil, and vinegar. The, oops, I'm sorry. The nonpolar amino acids are like the oil, and the polar ones are like the vinegar. And if you shake up the oil and vinegar, think of what you notice. The oil likes to stay with the oil, and the vinegar likes to stay with the vinegar. Well, this is a very important uh, characteristic of proteins because this is, these forces are what determine the ultimate shape or the ultimate fold of the active protein. Now, amino acids are connected to each other by chemical uh, peptide bonds, and they are connected, they are connected uh, in a chain, a sequence of amino acids connected together like a chain. And the sequence of those amino acids are determined by our genes, our DNA. It's the linear sequence that determines the protein's ultimate fold and shape and its function. And this linear sequence of amino acids is called the protein's primary structure. Now there are four levels of structure. The second level is the secondary structure. And this is when small regions of that chain fold up locally into readily recognized patterns. For instance, we have an alpha helix, and we have a beta pleated sheet, or a beta pleated strand, and when they are next to each other, they may form a sheet. The next level is when those alpha helices and those pleated strands and sheets orient themselves relative to each other to form an overall folded protein of that amino acid chain. And this is called the tertiary structure. Now many proteins are made up by, of more than one chain of amino acids. So we call each of those chains subunits, and those subunits come together to form the larger complex and the fully active protein. So this is called the quaternary structure. So, how do we pick our targets? In fact, deciding what drug target we're going to work on to try and treat a disease is fundamentally the most important decision we ever make in the drug discovery business. How, do, how have we done this historically? Well, we've used animal and cellular models, which are very poor predictors in the end of human outcome. But you work with the tools you've got. Now, we have better tools. We have the human genome. And in fact, we've had that for about 15 years. And it takes a long time for a new technology, a new insight, to actually translate into drugs uh, or, or good information we can utilize. But if you have a genetic link to disease, your probability of success is much higher. We have opportunistic observations where we may have a drug in the clinic, and we can see how the patient is responding, and that may give us new insights. We also tap into the scientific literature. This is how we tap into what is happening in basic research in, in the laboratories that are funded by the NSF and the NIH, as well as our competitors. We all publish the science we work on, and we all learn from that science. It's very important, even as a company, that we publish science and contribute back to the overall understanding of the fundamental biology. Now, the other thing that's happened is everything we do is far more complex than when I started in the industry, and therefore collaborative research is a very big part of what we do. And we collaborate with academic institutions, individual researchers, as well as other companies. 
small biotechs, as well as large pharma, and I'll show you an example of that later on in the talk. So, the most important thing ultimately is you really have to understand your disease process. And that is very difficult, it's very complex. Now, a lot of, lot of research has to go into doing that. So, how do we discover a drug? What is the process? Well, we break this down into uh, two main buckets, pharmaceutical discovery and pharmaceutical development. In development, you're going into the clinic, you're working with hospitals, patients, and a lot of regulatory, so your costs are extremely high, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in investment in any given molecule. Now, we pick our drug targets right back here at the very beginning of the process. And what you need to appreciate is that 99% or more of the targets we pick are gonna fail to ever get a drug to the market. So everything we do is about failure, frankly. Our success rates are really, really low. So you go back to the patient and you say, why do I get up every day and do this? It's because I know there's a patient waiting. And everybody knows that within, within the industry. Now the other thing to appreciate are the timelines I put on top. And these are averages. So hepatitis C, I started uh, working on, it was already initiated. When I started 20 years ago, we just launched that onto the market. So you're talking about long-term investment. It takes a long time to get a, an idea, discover the drug, put it through, make sure it's safe and efficacious, and get it to the market, and it can cost you billions of dollars. How many industries do you know of that will invest billions of dollars per molecule over 20 years before they ever make a dime? There isn't one. So that's important to understand. The other thing to understand is that we patent our drugs to protect them at the end of the discovery phase when we're feeling pretty good that we've got things and, and a quality molecule. A patent in the US is good for 20 years. So if you spend another 10 years developing your drug and get it on the market, you've now got 10 years of patent life left on that molecule to recoup your investment. And you're not just recouping your investment for that one molecule, you have to be able to fund all the failures that were associated with getting that one molecule to the market. So it's a, a very long, very expensive process with a lot of risk. Let's focus on pharmaceutical discovery, which is where I focus and, and uh, we're talking most about today. Well, you've already heard about target identification. So we gotta pick that target. Then we need to come up with a starting point, a small molecule or an antibody that allows us then to try and do some target validation. Are we, is our target choice really good? Can we replicate what we expect? Well, once again, we're back to animal and cellular models again, which are very poor predictors. If you're a mouse with cancer, we are awesome at curing your cancer. People, not so much. So it's very difficult. Um, then we have to take that lead and actually turn it into a drug. And that's where a lot of work comes in that we'll talk about. So the take home message is that this is a very time consuming, very expensive process um, and the patient's waiting. So we're always thinking at every single step along this way, how can we improve our process to make it faster faster and try and reduce those timelines. And we'll show you how structure can be critical uh, to doing that, certainly in the discovery phase. Failure rates are very high. Why do we fail? What can structure do to help? I'll show you some uh, data on that as well. Everything we're doing is getting more complex. The targets are getting more complex, but what is a drug? And, and, and the different types of drugs uh, are getting more complex but that's also presenting a great opportunity. So why do we fail? In the early stage, in the phase one, preclinical phase, most of our compounds drop out due to toxicities. Now we do a tremendous amount to try and de-risk our compounds before they get into the clinic because if you have a late stage 
clinical trial and your billion dollars or more into your drug, that can destroy many companies. So you definitely don't want that happening too often. So we try our best to de-risk, but again, the tools aren't optimal yet. And so we lose a lot of compounds to toxicity early. But what's particularly scary, because our investment has now started to really skyrocket, are failures out in phase two and phase three, where the reason we fail is efficacy. So what does that mean? The drug isn't working. That means our drug target choice either wasn't right or we don't have the right approach yet. So that's really devastating for us. So what can we do to improve our probability of success? Well, I already mentioned that if you have a genetic link to disease, your probability of success is much higher than if you don't. Another tool that we try to develop each time we go into the clinic is what we call a biomarker, something else that we can measure in the body that tells us our drug is working through the mechanism we expect and is having the effects that we expect. So a very simple biomarker, easy to follow, is hepatitis C. We measure your viral loads when you're infected, we treat you with drug, and we watch those viral loads plummet, okay? If we can have something like that every time we go into the clinic, our probability of success, oops, is much higher. So, but those are very difficult to identify, those biomarkers. Now, I told you that it's very expensive to develop a drug. Between 2003 and 2014, the costs have gone up 145% to, oh, nuts, um, to uh, 2.6 billion. In fact, I was talking to someone today, the new estimates are getting up close to $4 billion per molecule. Again, that includes all the costs involved in de discovering and developing that single agent, as well as all the associated failures that go in because our success rates are so low, and we have to cover that cost. So it's very expensive to do, but think about the expense of not doing what we do. What if we didn't come up with that cure for hepatitis C? What, if, what would happen to the healthcare budgets if we actually came up with a treatment or a cure for Alzheimer's disease? And so you always have to put these things into perspective. And when we price drugs, we price them because they have to be a value to the payers, to the insurance. It has to be a great treatment for the patient, but you have to look at the overall cost it takes to care for an Alzheimer's patient, and you price your drug so that it is a bargain if the insurance companies want to pay for that drug. So, again, back to the actual process. We've picked our target, we cloned, we've overexpressed it. Now we need to go find those lead starting points, and that's panning for gold. We take a million compounds in our compound collection, screen them against every target, and that takes a lot of automation and IT support. So it looks like this. You have your drug target. You're going to run your compound collection against that target, look in some sort of binding or activity assay. And what you're hoping to find is not just one binder, but a collection of binders that are chemically diverse. Because the odds that you'll take any one of these and turn it into a drug are astronomically small. So you want to have lots of shots on goal. So you've got your starting point. Now the hard work begins. The chemist starts to make thousands of compounds. And they're looking to get to that magic drug candidate that doesn't just have most of these properties. Nowadays, you have to have all of these properties in a drug. It has to be potent, selective, non-toxic, orally active. You have to be able to make it at, at a reasonable price. And you have to be able to own it. And in fact, um, while this used to be somewhat disease state dependent and predominantly because of toxicity, if you're a cancer patient, you're going to die, you'll tolerate more toxicity. Well, not so much anymore because we've gotten so good at targeting cancer cells and reducing the amount of toxicity that, in fact, we're really looking for treatments that are as non-toxic as possible. So it's a very complex puzzle. And you have to juggle all of these things simultaneously. And after all of that work, and you've spent years, maybe a decade, getting to this molecule, 
After all of that, you'll go into the patient, you have no idea whether it's going to work. So that could be all for nothing, and often is. So, what is a drug? Well, as Lisa showed you, it's a pill. It's aspirin, or a capsule, but it's a, it's a small molecule, chemical entity. When I entered the business 20 years ago, that's what it was. Well, look at what it is today. Completely different. In fact, the biggest selling drug in the world, happens to be ours, Humira, is an antibody for rheumatoid arthritis and 15 other indications. But why stop there? We're getting very creative in what we learn, and so now we start to create our own novel biologics, ones that can actually bind to two targets. It's like taking two drugs in, in one shot. Always having technological breakthroughs. Another one is, what if you could take advantage of the extreme specificity of an antibody targeted to a cancer cell and attach a toxin to it? so that it goes only to the cancer cell and kills that cancer cell very effectively. There's gene therapy. Now we're learning. We're actually learning how to take the body's own processes and turn that against the disease state and have them process the degradation of drug targets. We're also doing this in terms of turning our immune system against cancer cells. It's a tremendous revolution that's going on stem cells, and on and on. And this is only a small smattering of the different things that are now drugs uh, and what, what a drug means. Now, we've got a lot of opportunity because we have these great breakthroughs in, in uh, technologies. We have an aging population with a lot of medical unmet need. But still, our costs are high and our success rates are very low. Historically, the FDA was a bit of a thorn in the side, but that was back when we were all trying to capture a part of the Lipitor market or something like that. We were chasing too much the dollar. When we shifted our focus and really focused on medical unmet need, well, now we go back to the FDA and say, hey, we've got a cure for hepatitis C or we've got a great treatment for lymphocytic leukemia. Guess what? The FDA is our friend and they help us advance that as quickly as possible through clinical trials to get that treatment to the patients. But there are a lot of other pressures, finite uh, healthcare budget, so we know our drug has to be a value to the patient, it has to be a value to the payers, the insurance companies. So again, we bring a lot of technologies in to make us more efficient, more effective at what we do and at least on the discovery side of things, really trying to speed the process as much as we can. And today we're really focused on structural biology. That's what we use this facility for. So. So how do we, dis how do we determine the structure of a protein target or a drug? Well, consider a microscope a light microscope. And let's put an object on the stage, a protozoan, and we'll shine visible light on it, and the visible light gets scattered by the object. Then we insert some lenses so that we can see the object enlarged. So we can see fine detail that you cannot see with the naked eye. But wouldn't it be great if we could take our protein molecules and our potential drug candidates and put them on the microscope to see what they look like, see where the atoms are? Well, unfortunately, we cannot do that. And that's because the size of the specimen that we can see is limited by the wavelength of the light that is uh, the incoming light that gets scattered. So microscopes operate here in the region of the spectrum of visible light. And the size of the specimens that we can see are a fraction of a micron. With protein molecules, we want to see where the atoms are located. We want to see the difference, to see this atom separate from the, the next one. We want to see atoms separated by a chemical bond. And the length of a chemical bond is one to two angstroms. So the protozoan, fraction of a micron, bond lengths, angstroms. Angstrom is one ten thousandth of a micron. So that's a huge difference. So the wavelength of light that we really need 
is in the x-ray region. We need x-rays to see the distance and separation of actual atoms. So what if we take our microscope and now we use x-rays? Well, that's another problem. There are no lenses that will focus and reconstitute uh, the scattered x-rays. It also would be a bad idea if we had x-rays and we were looking down into the microscope, too much radiation exposure. So we do it a different way. We use a technique that's called x-ray crystallography. So what is x-ray crystallography? We take our molecule and we put it in a beam of x-rays and the x-rays get diffracted. And because there's no lens to recombine those scattered x-rays, we actually measure them on a detector. And there are two things that we're interested in measuring. We want to measure the position of those scattered x-rays, which we call reflections, and we want to measure the intensity of them. And then mathematically, we calculate a model of what that protein is, or that uh, drug target is like. Now, if we put a molecule, a protein, in the x-ray beam, the molecule's really, really small. So that would be a feat in and of itself. But the x-rays that get diffracted would be very, very weakly diffracted because the molecule's so small, and those weakly diffracted x-rays would be too weak to even measure with a detector. What we really need are many molecules, and we need them all lined up in order in three dimensions. Well, how in the world are we going to line up protein molecules? We have a solution for that, too. We grow crystals of these protein molecules. Now, growing crystals, growing protein crystals, is an art. Think back to when you grew or made rock candy. Did you try to grow a sugar crystal as big as possible? or maybe as perfect as possible? Well, growing crystals of proteins is very similar, and we try to do the same thing. We want them to be fairly sizable, and we want them to be absolutely perfect. In the crystal, we have our protein molecules, and they're ordered. But they may not be all ordered in the same way. We might have one rotated. For instance, rotated 180 degrees. So here we have a two-fold axis of symmetry. And then, this grouping would be repeated in three dimensions so that we'd have a three-dimensional crystal. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Dutch artist, M.C. Escher, and his, he's well known for his tessellations. His tessellations exhibit all sorts of elements of symmetry, two-fold axis, three-fold axis, four-fold, six-fold. Certainly worth taking a look. Well, that symmetry is very important to us in our calculations in crystallography when we build a model of our protein. So crystals come in many different shapes, and they range in size from a few microns to a couple hundred microns. And we put the crystal in the x-ray beam, and we rotate the crystal, and we collect images of the diffracted rays. And we collect many of these images. This is just one, and you can see the spots or the reflections, we record their location and we record their intensity. So you see some very strong ones and we see some very weak ones. And then we have to be, to go ahead and calculate what the protein structure looks like. Now this can be very challenging at times, especially with some of these large molecules that the pharmaceutical company is working with. So we have to be very careful that if we run into any obstacles or any results that don't make any sense, we have to go back and look at our data very carefully, make sure that nothing fishy is happening with our data. So once we have it, then we, we have our structure. But wait a second, that doesn't look like the protein structure you looked at earlier, does it? Well, recall that uh, it's when x-rays hit a molecule, it's actually the, the electrons in the atoms that are diffracting the x-rays. So when we are calculating the model, what we are calculating is where the electrons are located. And what we get is a map. Oh, sorry. We get a map of where those electrons are, and it looks like this green cage. 
and then sitting with computer graphics and 3D goggles, a scientist will build a protein model and fit it to that cage of electron density. So you see inside the cage, there's the blue. These are, this is the model of the protein. And this happens to be a side chain, an amino acid side chain. This would be the backbone. This is a slab, so you can't see. It's probably going in and out of the plane of the screen. And what's remarkable about this, this, this is the side chain tyrosine, and you can see the hole in the middle of the electron density. That's an indication that this data is very high resolution and very good quality. Okay, so now we've built our model, and so here's our protein structure. So can you see the alpha helices and the beta strands? Kind of difficult, huh? Yeah, so, there have been a number of graphics tools that have been developed over the years, and we can display our protein molecules in a variety of ways so that we can see the points of interest so that we can do our research and design better molecules that could bind to these proteins. So take a look at this image of this protein, its orientation, and its color scheme, and on the next image, I'll show you another way to look at it. Now I stripped away all of the amino acid side chains, so it's just the backbone, and now it's rendered as a ribbon. Now you can see the alpha helices, and you can see the beta strands forming a beta sheet. So protein structures are truly remarkable to study. In fact, their beauty has captured the eye of more than just scientists. Irving Geis was a very talented artist, and he's helped illuminate structural biology in many of his paintings and sketches of crystallographic models of biologically important molecules. You'll recognize this one, DNA. Here's hemoglobin. These are all paintings, by the way. They're really remarkable. Myoglobin. And the one you just saw, that was lysozyme. What you saw in the previous slides was actually a computer uh, model from the actual data of, of the of the protein crystal. This is the painting. Pretty accurate. So Irving Geis's drawings and sketches are archived digitally on a website called the Protein Data Bank, and you'll hear about that shortly. So why is this information so valuable to us in uh, the pharmaceutical industry? Well, the answer is pretty simple. If you don't have that information and you're a chemist trying to make a drug, you're blindfolded. You're playing a very expensive game of hot and cold making a change. You have no idea where the pitfalls are, no idea where the treasure is. But a crystal structure is like a very high resolution map that tells you exactly where you are and look, she can see the drug, she can see the pot of gold. He still looks puzzled. I'm not sure what's going on there. <laughs> But, you know, the experienced person knows how to read and interpret that map. And what that tells us, as Lisa pointed out, is where the drug is in the binding site. And now, in this case, I have oxygens colored as red. They're negatively charged. Nitrogens are positively charged, colored blue here. So very fundamentally, we want opposites to attract. We want our reds and our blues to come together. And so, you see our reds and blues are all matching up very nicely. Let's just say they weren't here. There was a clash. I can tell the chemist that. I can tell them what to change it to to get a good fit. In this case, the carbons, which are grease, are green on the protein. I have them colored uh, salmon on the drug, but grease wants to be with grease, so we need to make sure that is happening. Now, if you're a chemist, you need to improve your drug we can tell you the exact size, shape, dimensions, uh, volume, and the properties in every sub pocket of that binding site. So when I can bring that to you in real time, you can see where you are, you can see where you need to go, you can see the volume and the, and the properties, and you're not gonna waste your time, hopefully, making things on your molecule that won't fit that, that, those criteria. So I think it's fairly clear why this information, if I could bring it to a chemist every day in real time, 
would be so empowering to the chemist. Plus, we discover the unexpected all the time. Every time we do one of these structures, it's something nobody's ever seen before. So that's very exciting. Now, uh, the other thing that is good to know is that there's a public database for all these structures. Now, of course, the ones we use in pharma, we keep to ourselves, but we do publish uh, a lot. If, if most of our work eventually gets deposited also in this public database. But that's something anyone in this audience can go and they can go look and look at structures, pull them up, and, uh, and learn about those. Um, so I encourage you to go because it is really very cool. So what does the pharmaceutical industry do here at Argonne? Well, in 1990, several pharmaceutical companies came together and collaborated to establish what is known as IMCA. IMCA is the Industrial Macromolecular Crystallography Association. And they did this in order to build a state-of-the-art research facility that they could share. These pharma companies rely on structural biology, X-ray crystallography, as an essential part of the drug discovery and development research process. The facilities that the companies share here is truly world class. It's located right here at the advanced photon source at the synchrotron. Now over the years, from 1990 to present, there have been many, many companies that have been members of IMCA. Today, there are five major pharmaceutical companies. AbbVie, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Merck, Novartis, and Pfizer. IMCA is unique. It's unique worldwide. While these companies are all competitors, they work together collaboratively, as Vinny just said. They work together for their common need, which is reliable, regular access to synchrotron radiation for their crystallography supporting drug discovery programs. Now the experiment facilities here, the APS, the companies conduct research in a wide variety of therapeutic areas. Great. So the question is, why do we invest in IMCA? Why have we been doing this for 25 years? And the answer is really pretty simple at this point. We've demonstrated uh, to our companies that we can have a great impact on drug discovery in our companies across all the complex types of targets that uh, we're working on. What IMCA allows us to do is to do what we couldn't do as individual companies, to invest in that cutting edge technology, to improve the turnaround time and quantity, quality of the structure information, uh, and to tackle more and more challenging targets. We need the synchrotron, we need these facilities, we need the investment that the government makes in the DOE and that the DOE makes into these facilities, and we want to be partners with, uh, with the DOE and invest so that we can have a beam line that matches our needs and optimize to our needs because it's critical uh, to the patient. So what are these facilities? Well, I'm going to start with the synchrotron. You're here. Here's the auditorium. Here's where you are. And if we were to fly over the top, this is what the synchrotron looks like. Here's the auditorium. And it's a very large ring. It produces very bright and highly intense x-rays. And these are used for studying structure, chemistry, behavior of materials, both in the physical and the biological arenas. Very, very, very powerful and very, very, very impactful tool. Worldwide, the advanced photon source at Argonne is one of the most powerful synchrotrons. Now the whole process starts here with the LINEC, the linear accelerator. This emits electrons at a very high speed, which then enter into a booster synchrotron where they're accelerated to speeds that are almost the speed of light. They then go into the larger storage ring of the synchrotron. 
and around the storage ring are an array of magnets. Now the insertion devices are special system magnets and when the electrons pass through the insertion devices, they produce x-rays. Now these x-rays are harnessed by the researchers in what we call a beam line and experiment end station. So if we look at the IMCA beam line, singing on the other side of the ring here. So here are the beam lines that all come off on a tangent from the storage ring. And the IMCA beam line has a lot of optical components, but there are two that are noteworthy. The first one is the monochromator. So like a prism splits the light into its different wavelengths of visible light, the monochromator does the same thing with x-rays. It splits the x-rays into different wavelengths or different energies so that we can select one of them to do our experiments. In crystallography, we need x-rays all of the same wavelength. And sometimes we need to different wavelengths, so it's nice to have it to be tunable so we can select which wavelength we want to use. So that's a very important component is the monochromator. It gives us monochromatic x-rays to use for the experiments. The second component are the focusing mirrors. Now these mirrors are long mirrors, they bend ever so slightly, and they will focus the beam in the horizontal and vertical directions to a very small, small size. And we want that size to match our sample. Our samples are typically, the crystals are typically five microns to about 50 microns, and so we can focus down to 25 by 70 microns, and then we use apertures or pinholes to get even smaller so we can match it to the x-ray beam to our crystals. So indeed, the synchrotron produces very, very intense x-rays that are essential for our work. At the IMCA Beamline, the companies have been using the Beamline for 25 years. We've invested very heavily in robotics and high-speed detectors so we can do very, very high through put experiments. Our experiments are all in protein crystallography. Over 20,000 structures are solved per year and when they are published, they are deposited into the protein data bank accessible for everybody. And in the end, there have been many, many drugs that have been developed having a very profound impact on fighting disease. Okay, home stretch. Everybody still awake? Marcus? Got my son there. Got to keep him up. Um, so, how do we discover the drugs? How do we use these facilities? Let me give you a real case example here. Um, and frankly, this is one of the most innovative drugs uh, out on the market today. But it started back in the early 90s with the understanding of the bi cell biology of what we call apoptosis. That's program cell death. All your cells will turn over and die at a certain point when they've reached their lifetime. What cancer cells have understood how to do is to hijack that system to become immortal. So how do they do that? Very simply, there are proteins called death proteins, and they bind to this BCL family of proteins, which are pro-life proteins. So they bind in a normal cell until they're signaled to release and, and go through cell death. But cancer cells, figured out that, well, if we create a lot of the BCL proteins and make sure that these death proteins are always bound up, we're immortal. So that's what they do. So the concept is really quite uh, straightforward. Let's make a drug that binds to these pro-life proteins and causes cancer cells selectively to die. Sounds great. Great idea. Well, the first thing is we have to understand the target. And we solved the structure with data collected down here at APS for the first complex of BCL bound to one of these death proteins. So this was very enlightening, also very terrifying. And the reason is because we have what we call a protein-protein interaction. If you look at the death protein where I'm just showing this one helix in yellow bound to BCL, it's a long surface. The affinity of the death protein for the pro-life protein is very high, it's tight. So if we want a drug, it's gotta be much tighter than the natural ligand, okay? So the, the drug that we're proposing to come up with 
is unlike anything anybody's ever tried to do before. It's going to be extremely potent. It's also going to be very large, unlike any orally active drug. In fact, nobody thought we could do this. So everything we did on this program, start to finish, including the technology we used, was all created to try and solve this problem. And with that, I'm going to do a, a great disservice and jump over 10 years of incredible innovation. And I'm going to go now to our second. This is our second drug candidate. A very potent molecule. It's very large. We understand the binding mode. We have the crystal structure. And this was so exciting because it was orally active, which nobody thought we could do. We partnered with Genentech to make sure that we could afford to take this into the clinic and test it on patients and try and get it to the market. In fact, we got it in. It was looking great. Phase one, phase two. And late in phase two, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Okay? So, you know, that's bad. I told you how bad it is. You've invested millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars now, and we're in phase two and we've got a problem. So what's the problem? The problem is what we call thrombocytopenia. It kills red blood cells. Now this was expected. We knew that this would happen because we saw it in our animal models and we understood the biology. The question that we were trying to ask in the clinic was, could we maximize the efficacy while managing the toxicity? And finally, what we came to the conclusion, and you can see, in a dose-dependent manner, we add more drug, we kill more red blood cells. The patient rebounds if we take away the drug, but so does the cancer. So we ultimately came to the conclusion that we're not going to be able to really drive the efficacy we need to make this an effective drug on the market. But it did work in patients and was quite remarkable. So that drug, Navitoclax, was designed to bind to multiple family members of these pro-life proteins. What we happen to know is that this one member, XL, is highly expressed in red blood cells. So it makes sense, the drug kills red blood cells. Whereas BCL2, is predominantly expressed in the cancer cells we were targeting. So again, a fairly obvious question. What happens if we make a drug that is selective for BCL2 and avoids the, the dose-limiting toxicity problem? Sounds great. Makes a lot of sense. Until, once again, you go back and you look at the proteins and you say to yourself, well, there are four amino acids that are different between these two proteins. They're basically identical. None of those amino acids interact directly with the drug. So it looks like an impossible task. How are we going to do this? Well, the first thing that the chemistry teams did was they went back to the thousands and thousands of compounds they've made over now 15 years and reprofiled them. And what we're looking for are BCL2 potent compounds. So you want a small number here and you want a large number there, okay? And look, we found two. That's pretty exciting. It's not nearly potent enough, but at least there's an indication that maybe there is a way we can do this. So when we see data like this, we want to get a crystal structure and understand it. And we got the crystal structure of one of these, and what we figured out was that for potent BCL XL molecules, we had to fill this pocket, but BCL2 didn't seem to care. So that's really interesting. That's a, that's a key insight. The unfortunate part about that insight is, well, but how this doesn't teach me how to make the drug more potent for BCL2. It just tells me why it's selective. So what are we going to do? Well, what was really cool was this wasn't actually what the crystallographer saw. Lisa told you about crystal packing. The proteins come together and they pack. They make contacts with each other. And in this particular case, what the crystallographer actually saw was a neighboring BCL2 protein molecule stuck one of its residues to make a crystal, con a crystal contact uh, with this tryptophan residue. So it stacks under. And what this tells us, nature and, and being able to look at this information the way we did taught us exactly how to make BCL2 selective molecules because 
it makes a hydrogen bond to this aspartate. And that aspartate is a glutamate in BCLXL. A glutamate is another acid, but it's much longer and cannot make such an optimal hydrogen bond. The crystallographer recognized this. Now understand how this happened. We sent our crystals down one uh, day. That night, the data was collected. The next morning, the crystallographer looked at the data, solved the structure, made this observation. Within two days, this information is to the chemist. They looked at it, they understood it, and they went right off, and within a few months, they made compounds that did exactly what we wanted. They stacked in here, they made this hydrogen bond. Now look at this number, got much smaller and we maintain the selectivity. This was a transformational breakthrough for this program because we didn't know where to go. So we still needed a more potent molecule, so we went back to the structure. This is what we do. We use this information, and we realize there's another residue there that we could potentially interact with. Now, this residue is conserved in both family members, so one might expect to pick up potency against XL, but hopefully, we can also drive the potency for BCL2. And literally within, uh, le actually less than a year, we got to this very exciting drug candidate called ABT199. Look how low that number is for BCL2. And as we expected, we did pick up activity against XL, but you have to look at the window between the two. And the fold difference was certainly large enough um, that we thought we had an effective treatment. And when we look at cell, cell models that are BCL2 driven, we have a very low number. If it's XL driven, it's a high number. So we're seeing the cellular selectivity that we expected. So what happens uh, with the key toxicity issue? Well, if you look at Naviticlax here, that really just whacks our red blood cells. So this means it's killing red blood cells very uh, efficiently at five mg per kg at whopping loads of ABT199, we're having almost no effect on the red blood cells. So that's cool. Now, what about its efficacy? Now, this is mouse data, all right? We've talked about mouse data, but I'll explain in a moment. But here you can see in the control of tumors go crazy and, and get huge. In the presence of 199, we actually see tumor regression. Now, for various reasons, I can't show you the clinical data here today. This drug is now on the market. So it's been through all of the clinical trials and has had remarkable impact. But let me just tell you about the phase one trial, our first indication in humans. We took a single dose into patients, and in 24 hours, they saw 90% tumor re reduction. It was remarkable. I mean, you just don't see things like that. In fact, the, it kills so efficiently that we really had to work on getting the dose just right because if you kill uh, large masses of tumor cells too quickly, it overwhelms the body and that causes issues. So we have managed to thread that needle, figure that all out. We have that drug out on the market and it represents uh, over 15 years of drug discovery, and then the FDA fast-tracked it because it was such a remarkable drug uh, for patients. So everything we did on this program uh, was innovative start to finish, and I wish I had time to tell you more about all of that. But time, you know, equals unmet medical need for the patient. We had to move quickly, yes. It was a long program, but as we learned, and as we learned what the problems were, when we took the compounds into patients, we were able to rapidly respond. And the data that we collected here at APS, having these facilities funded by the government and, and our Beamline funded by the collaboration of our companies was absolutely critical to getting this drug discovered and getting it quickly out to patients. So, I'd just like to wrap it up by thanking all the teams that supported that particular program, but the key lesson that we always take away is you never give up. You have to be incredibly tenacious if you're gonna survive in this space, in this business, 
And as I say, if you don't have the patient in mind, you won't make it. So uh, again, I'll thank you very much. Uh, thank you both. Uh, very fascinating. I think uh, we've all earned an advanced degree in biology this evening, so thank you all. <laughs> Quite impressive. Uh, really fantastic. Uh, I have a brief, brief request for the audience, and that is uh, please remain seated uh, following our usual Q&A period. We want to show you a brief a video uh, featuring the next Argonne Out Loud uh, lecture. But right now we have a few, uh, time for a few questions, and I ask you to be patient and we'll get you a microphone uh, so that you can actually be heard, and uh, we'll answer, ask uh, Lisa and Vincent to answer questions here, please. Um, one question, or two. Well, there's some drugs that are being developed which does cure the, the disease or the cure, whatever. But um, like there's some advertising drugs that has a long list of um, um, what you call it um, side effects. Side effects. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then number two would be you mentioned about cost. There's some drugs like the aspirin. It's a very cheap drug and does help a lot. But then there's other drugs that are very very expensive, like the yep. EpiPen that all of a sudden you know it was economical and then boom, it bust very high. Why is it that those Drugs are so costly. Yeah, so great questions, and I'm really glad you asked it. Let's start with the advertisements. Um, and there's a lot of mixed feeling about whether we should be advertising or not. But if a pharmaceutical company chooses to advertise for their drug, what you have to understand is they are required by law to list every single side effect that was ever seen in a clinical trial. Now, what you have to understand about that is when we do a clinical trial, we are rigorously recording any side effect, any observation, whether it has anything to do with the drug or not. We are not allowed to make a judgment call as to whether or not it really is drug related or just you happen to get, catch a cold that day. Um, and, and those must be read in, in everything. Um, and, and they don't tell you how frequently those side effects, you know, so it could be one patient out of thousands, we have to list it there. So it, it, it really causes a problem, which is one of the reasons why, you know, personally, I'm not, it does seem to help sales, but I, I deal with this all the time. People are like saying, oh my God, that drug can do this and kill that, and you know, that, that's not necessarily the case. Now, uh, the drug pricing. What one really has to do, because it's really unfortunate um, that a lot of damage has been done to the pharmaceutical industry's um, reputation, because you have some companies that aren't investing in R&D that see these opportunities where they can jack the prices up. And that's just bad actor, that's bad. People are being prosecuted for that, and, and rightfully so. What the larger pharma does and this is why it's so important to understand when I say, in fact, I'm not even sure I remembered to say this, but we put 10 to 20% of our profits back into R&D. And we're doing that. Um, and, and then as I told you, how we set the prices, we have to look at the whole economic cost of what it took to discover, develop. Um, you know, again, we are still a company. so. We're just, we can't do things uh, at least across the board for free. We do a lot of things, by the way, to make prices, um, or make drugs available to people that can't pay. But anyway, there's a whole process to how the drug prices are set. And yes, they, they often can seem like a really big number. Um, and at the end of the day, when you look at all of the healthcare costs, actually drug the pharmaceutical industry is about 10 to 11 percent of that. The problem that we face is we're the one segment that doesn't get as much insurance coverage, even though we're saving the insurance companies a bundle of money. So it, it is complex, but there is some bad actors, 
and it's terrible. And it's, you know, in fact, there's really been a push. Uh, we have um, a big pharma consortium of the big pharma, and, and it's like a club. And now what they're saying is, we don't want the people that aren't investing in R&D to a certain level associated with that, because we try to be responsible with our pricing, and they give us a bad name. Yeah, I got a question regarding the, uh, the beam line. Uh, just curious, uh, how much work is now being done remotely? Uh, is it growing, the work being done remotely on the beam line versus you know, physically being here? Uh, what do you foresee as you go forward in your particular area? I'm not sure I heard the entire question. Uh, just regarding the beam line and working remotely with uh, the beam remotely, line. Remotely, yes. Um, so yes, yeah, so scientists can arrive on site and conduct their experiments um, in person, but we also have the, the um, equipment and the computers and all of the protocols set up so that experimenters can conduct experiments remotely. We have all the robotics. That's a key point of that, is we have robots for s mounting samples. We have everything automated on the beam line so we can keep the beam on the sample. The, actually, the x-ray beam tends to move around a lot. Um, that, that's rather natural, but we control that very tightly so we can can, we can run experiments actually unattended, completely unattended in auto mode, and that's how we operate and use the facility overnight, is we set up this whole series of jobs that run, run through the night. In the morning we come in and we look through all the, the uh, data that are collected and we go back and we might recollect a few that need to be recollected. But with the pharmaceutical companies now, what they're doing is they're sending all of their samples to us and we're running a mail-in mode. So our staff are actually setting up all the experiments and running all the data. Everything is secure so that the companies have their secure portal to log into to access their data, bring it back to their home laboratory. So it's almost like the synchrotron is sitting right across the hall from their office. I'm not coming down and I'm not sleeping in a van by the river anymore, <laughs> and I love it. I do want to say that um, Advi was responsible for developing our very first robot on our beamline. Yep. And uh, it's called the Actor System. It was um, licensed to another company who, who uh, commercialized it, and then we have uh, generation two or three at this point. Uh, but that actor robot has really changed the way we do experiments. There's a question yeah. here in the center. I, I have a question. Uh, with the resistant uh, antibiotic uh, strains, is anybody here working on, on that? So um, there was a big exodus, and, and AbbVie got out as well at one point out of antibiotic research. And currently, AbbVie is not doing research in that area. But there are companies that are really coming back because of the problem of drug resistance is getting larger and larger. And so there, there are pharmaceutical companies that are really focused on that. And that's also a prime space for biotech as well. One more question? Do we, I have time for perhaps one more here in the center, please. Right. And, and, you know, that's a big thing. We just, uh, the head of uh, R&D at Pfizer, I was just at a course teaching, and he gave a lecture about this topic. And, you know, competition's critical. And, and what happens sometimes is in some of these markets, the competition is, is dried up, and that does allow the bad actors to do what they do. And EpiPen's a good example. Yes. Interested in that uh, picture you had on the x ray, and you showed all those dots. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you use Myra or Aurora to do the calculations to make that molecule, the structure? So there's a suite of. Oh, no, no, we use programs to do that. There are a variety of suites of programs that we use to do that, and so um, and we can talk more about those after. But uh, it's. Um, Crystal graphic specific programs that will do that will be 
It's a rather complex process. We have a phasing problem because we have all those x-rays, they actually have a phase, and so those bright spots and the weak spots come about because you have constructive and destructive interference by, from all those x-rays. And so uh, there are a number of programs that we use to solve this, quote, phase problem. Very good, Olders. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so um, obviously we pay uh, into IMCA for the beamline and, and money goes uh, to the APS um, for that beamline. But when we collect data, uh, we pay an extra fee uh, to the APS, to the DOE, uh, so that we can have our uh, data be proprietary. So the IMCA companies financially support the facilities here at 100%. Yep. A couple more questions here in the center. Already happening, but it's funny because just a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking about this, knowing people that were really pushing personalized medicine, you know, 15 years ago, and they were being laughed at, you know, and why would we ever want to do that? Well, guess what? That's exactly what we're doing because if I can give you a drug that I know is going to be beneficial to you because we've done the genotyping, you know, that is great for everybody. And, uh, and, and then if I can tailor make a drug to the other populations that don't respond as well as you do, again, that is great for everybody. And so that is now a reality. But what drives that reality is the innovation in sequencing technology. Because now we can do that quick and cheap. And, and so before this, that was a very expensive and time-consuming process. So there are a lot of different technologies that are actually working in synergy um, that most people don't think about. So just one last question. Let's go back here, please. I would like to know where generic drugs come from. So um, <laughs> when our patents run out, then any generic company can take from our patents, our process, and our drug molecules, they can make them themselves and they can sell them. For small molecules, that's pretty straightforward because all of the process to synthesize and characterize your drug and make sure that you're giving the same thing that we were giving is very easy. When it comes to biologics, it's much more complex because antibodies are made not in a test tube, they're made by living cells. And so that process is much more complex. And for a generic to say, I'm making the same thing, in fact, they can't do it. They call them biosimilars because they're not exactly the same and they can never be uh, because the process is too complex. Okay. Um, so, I, I'm not sure I can answer that specifically. I can say that if they are biologics, um, because those are so expensive to make and so complex to make, the price differential isn't always so great. Um, and again, it comes back to competition. How many generic companies are out there doing it? Um, and, and again, there won't be a lot on the biosimilar side as there will be on the small molecule side. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Lisa and Vincent. Thank you very much. Yep.
I'm sure, I'm sure they'll be around for a while if you'd like to come up and ask a few questions. Now let's watch the uh, video regarding our next Al Argonne Out Loud lecture, uh, which is uh, July 20th on science and the future of food. I would say the biggest issue is the double or triple or quadruple whammy of, of global change. And by global change, you know, of course, we mean climate change, but we also mean population growth, resource depletion, groundwater depletion. All of these factors are coming together simultaneously to create a really sort of a perfect storm over the next few decades. And so trying to figure out how to, you know, feed 9 billion people in 2050 is much more than just trying to figure out how to adapt to climate change. We are just starting to understand how to use nutrition to manage wellness and treat disease. Everything from depression and anxiety all the way through to obesity and metabolic disorders. We have 30 to 40 trillion microbes living inside us, some thousand to 2,000 species of organisms. This is an immense complex ecosystem which is changing our body all the time and our body is responding and reacting to it. We call this the microbiome, the understanding of the microbial ecology of our body, and how food changes that ecology can have profound effects on our health. When we grow bioenergy crops, we have to grow them in the same land resources and water resources that we use for food. So, so finding ways to grow both at the same time while minimizing environmental impacts is really critical. We have one world and our role as scientists is really to, to think up better ways to manage our land. We need to do that in a way that's economically competitive uh, and, uh, and supportable and sustainable. Uh, and that's really what we are trying to do. You know, so we're trying to, to, to find ways that make sense both from the environmental and the socioeconomic perspective. I primarily study these days climate change and its impacts on various human and environmental systems, agriculture, forestry, coastal systems. And what we do in my group is really try to figure out how we can better use data and comp high performance computation and models in order to really span that gap of scales all the way from precision agricultural technologies for farmers so that they can more efficiently use fertilizers and irrigation water, conserve resources, reduce environmental externalities all the way up to providing information products for NGOs so that they can better respond to um, emerging droughts and food crises as they're occurring um, on the ground in developing countries. Oh, very good. Please uh, plan to join us on July 20th, that is. Please uh, thank you again for coming out this evening. Uh, please uh, pick up a copy of Argonne uh, now uh, on your way out, uh, please. and. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the evening and learned a few things along the way. So thank you very much.